There's also an innovation in cities for the climate, particularly in rock cities, uh, so Skopje, Bologna, and Lisbon, replicator cities. So four years ago, we realized that uh, small businesses and small entrepreneurs, they're not very well represented in the global arena, especially at COPs. When we think about the business as a stakeholder, it's usually large businesses, corporations. So we thought entrepreneurs and SMEs need to have a voice in the COPs. And this is why in COP21, we brought our first eco-entrepreneur to world decision makers. And so we did in COP24, COP22, sorry, Marrakesh, where one of our entrepreneurs uh, was a speaker at an SDG panel by the UN Foundation, so we got more visibility. And last year in Bonn, we brought uh, Sumit Kishore to uh, Bonn in Germany to present his sustainable mobility app for large Indian cities. So little by little entrepreneurs and SMEs are getting their voice heard by decision makers. And this year we're having Pietro Cecciarini over there, who's going to present his social business in a minute. All right, for the rock project. He was the winner of the rock hackathon in Bologna in May. So what is our contribution to the rock project in terms of boosting the green economy and social innovation in historic city centers? So basically, we're trying to reinforce and strengthen uh, local green ecosystems by involving all the stakeholders in the cities. And we boost green business creation. Pietro uh, uh, here, he has created a social enterprise uh, after a hackathon that we ran in, in Bologna. And now he's gone um, through some incubation processes by Climate Kick and by ourselves. So his project is becoming a social enterprise little by little, having an impact, and hopefully one day we'll create jobs and you know, um, address climate change in the city of Bologna as well. So we also try to foster the exchange of social and eco-innovation across cities in Europe, all right? Because it is the source of creativity, cooperation, stimulating impact, and also talent retention and talent attraction in cities, which is important. So we do so through activities like hackathons, incubation programs, uh, green funding consultation to know what are the best uh, green funding schemes for SMEs, also, policy recommendations at the city level to really foster an SME-based economy, and also replication methodologies to transfer that to other cities that want to, you know, join the fund. So, what is social innovation? This is a working definition that we've come up with over the last ten years of working on the ground. So, this is not in the dictionary. So, hopefully, one day it will be. Uh, for us, it's something radical, transgressive, disruptive, that uh, is oriented to action, committed to impact has you know, collective leadership, not just individual, but collective uh, entrepreneurship, uh, is structured around networks of people and um, through mechanisms of horizontal democracy. So the economic democracy is really important to really foster sustainability. And it uses technology for good, so tech for good. And the ultimate goal is to build equity and sovereignty in local communities. So that is the way we think is, is best to really foment sustainability and equity and democracy eventually, right? And peace, why not? So social entrepreneurship is adding the economic dimension to social innovation through a revenue generating schemes that really um, allow us to scale up impact and um, regenerating the economy from within. So we're trying to create new companies that are doing things well by doing good. Okay? So our proposal here for COP is a uh, five-step plan to mainstream social entrepreneurship, cultural heritage-driven social entrepreneurship in cities um, to really tackle or foster climate action at the ambition level that we need. So five-step plan. Step number one, framing the problem. We know the problem, climate change and inequalities, all right? But we also know the opportunity. Thanks to the IPCC, which is across the uh, hallway there, uh, we know that we need to change everything in 12 years' time. We need to reduce emissions globally in half. So that means changing the way we do everything in, 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 our, in our society, really. They were saying it themselves, the scientists. We need far-reaching and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. But those changes are going to benefit everyone, right, if we do it right. So we will build equity, we will build equitable societies. We're not only going to address climate change, but we're doing it in a way that is inclusive. That is the way forward. So framing the problem, step number two, Investing in a future that is sustainable and inclusive for everyone. That means we use a technique called future thinking, perhaps you've heard of it. It allows you to imagine and dream of a future that is ideal, that is perfect, where all the SDG goals are achieved fully. Then you go back to the present and you look for green signs, what's called green signs of that ideal future, but in the present. Meaning people that are doing things already very well, but it's still a minority in the economy. 
people like Pietro, you will see. And then we try to build what's called transition or bridge strategies to take that small present into a mainstream future. Right? So that is where it comes from this methodology. So the green science in the present is also not entrepreneurs. You, you, pre, you pretty much have these examples in every city right now building up, right? You go uh, last mile delivery on cargo bikes, that's pretty useful as well these days in city centers. You go eco markets uh, that are run by neighbors, right, that are directly in contact with local farmers. You go incentivized sustainable mobility schemes through apps, you know, that reward you with discounts in, in local commerce if you use the bike to go to work. You go also backbone, which is his project. I'm not going to get into that. It's about upcycling uh, plastic waste to also go post to a post uh, plastic society, not only post carbon but post plastic society. Growing pallets, so it's um, urban gardens on rooftops, which is quite useful in Mediterranean countries where the rooftops are, you know, plain in a flat. And also digital uh, marketplaces where you can put in pets, um, solar panel distributors with um, owners of rooftops. Okay, so these are just examples. But in order to boost green business creation, I have more of those examples in the present, you can build your own social innovation lab in your city. And what is a social innovation lab? It's not necessarily a physical place, it can also be a virtual or can be a combination of both. We have all the actors coming together. By actors, I mean the thinkers, the makers, the enablers, the activists. All, right, all of those are needed to really create social businesses that address climate change. And if you talk about climate change as the main problem that you're addressing, you can add online crowdsourcing because it's a global problem. You can also have global solutions elsewhere. You can transfer them to your local uh, environment. And also, once you have solutions on the ground like Pietro's, you can transfer them to other cities through replication methodologies or innovation journeys. So you take the delegation of in your city to other cities to know what's going on and try to replicate your model with entrepreneurs that are seeking ideas in your town. So for this purpose, we did, uh, we run eight climate thons last year in, in Europe. One of them was in Bologna through the Rock Project. And now we're trying to incubate those projects, and after that we will replicate them in other cities. So that's a little bit of process. So to strengthen the local, you have a lab in the city, and then you have to have an environment that supports the lab, an ecosystem, right? So you need to have a common vision of all the stakeholders in the city. All agree that you want to go 100% renewable at 2035. That's a common vision that is compelling. Then you need to have sustainable business networks. So peer-to-peer -peer networks that are going to support Pietro when he becomes a business. You need to have adequate legislation, uh, fiscal incentives, ethical public procurement. You know, the uh, public administration can really push the economy in the right direction through ethical procurement. Adequate funding, public-private partnerships that are much needed, also innovation lab support programs, etc., and education. All of this has to be embedded in a culture where the education is based in empathy, so understanding the other, and nature appreciation. Because in cities, sometimes we forget about nature. We only see cement and you know, uh, man-made materials. So bring the bring nature back to the cities, really wild cities. And then you scale up by um, cooperating with other cities. We have this network, Climate Innovation City. Check it out. We have 32 cities uh, hosting these climate innovation labs, and they are all running events and they are all exchanging best practices in, in this network of cities. So cities for the climate is a solution when nations are failing. Uh, cities are stepping up. To the play. And to conclude, uh, probably you know about Rebecca Solnit, this great thinker of our times, one of the best in, in terms of social change. She says that there is hope in the dark. There, we might be going through dark times, but there's always hope in darkness. Because you, it's about knowing where to look. Sometimes when you look at on stage, you only see monsters roaring for attention and uh, sort of diverting our attention to issues that are not important. But when you look at the markets at the fringes, you see people like Pietro changing things while nobody's looking, and they're called invisible revolutionaries, and they're doing the revolution that the rest of us are only hoping for. So COP24, it's now or never, it's today. So please, social innovation, climate action, let's do this.